All right. Well, good afternoon to all the folks on the East Coast and good morning to the folks in the Pacific Mountain and uh, Central Time Zones. Thanks for joining us again. This is the National Minority Quality Forum's weekly webinar, well, focusing mostly on issues related to COVID-19. As always, we have uh, our very own Mia Keys, formerly of NMQF, currently with the American Medical Association, uh, moderating today's panel. So as usual, I'll turn it over to the real expert, Mia Keys. Well, of course, every Friday I look forward to this hour, Brandon. Thank you so much uh, for continuously extending the invitation. Thank you so much to the NMQF team for being so very thoughtful about raising the conversations that are so very critical to this moment and beyond. And thank you to our viewership. We really appreciate your continued engagement and hopefully you're bringing more and more friends and greater thoughts and more, more um, granular questions to these conversations. Today we're going to have a really special talk with to two persons who are going to just break some things down for us in terms of clinical trials uh, and in terms of the role of the pharma industry with respect to helping us move through COVID-19 and, uh, and well, the overall novel coronavirus with respect to what's new, what's developing, and where we should be asking greater questions about our own involvement in science and research. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panelists for the day. We have with us Dr. Dar Richardson Heron, who comes from us or comes to us from uh, from Pfizer. She served where she serves as the chief patent officer. So we we have a lot of um, we'll, we're looking forward to the richness that she'll bring to the conversation. And we also have with us Dr. Katana Lemier, who joins us from Xavier University of Louisiana, where she serves as a, a professor of pharmacogenomics. And so. Today, we're going to really get into it. And, and I just want to start off by saying thank you to you both. Uh, how are you doing? Well, I'm doing great. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to join you today. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. And how about you? Thank Dr. you. Dr. Mm -hmm. Greetings from New Orleans, from the Big Easy. Yeah. And yeah. You, so thank you for asking. No doubt. We're really excited about the cross country. Uh, mix that we have going on here. I'm, I'm sitting in my home in DC, um, but, but New Orleans has certainly been on my heart during COVID, um, as has, you know, just, just and, and especially the South, you know, and I, and I hope that we can get into some regional conversation um, ab about all of that. But before we do, I just want you to, to both to just give me an overview about who you are, what, what, you, uh, what you represent for, to this world and, 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 and certainly to this moment. Can you, can you break that down a little bit for us? Yeah, so I'll start. Uh, I'm uh, Dr. Dara Richardson Heron. I'm the Chief Patient Officer at uh, Pfizer. Uh, and first, I want to just extend my heartfelt thanks and appreciation to Brandon and to the National Minority Quality Forum for inviting me to join you for the webinar. It's it's truly a small world. Just a few months ago, I was working with Drs. Puckren and 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 Wartman, uh, in with the organization in my capacity as uh, Chief Engagement Officer and Scientific Executive at the All of Us Research Program. But now I'm doing a, a webinar just a few months later uh, in my position at chief, as Chief Patient Officer at Pfizer. So it's really a, a, an awesome testimony to the incredible value and thought leadership that NMQF is bringing to organizations around the world. Um, for those of you who I haven't yet had the opportunity to meet, um, you know, I often describe myself as a physician by trade and an advocate by choice and laser focused on being a doctor, um, came from Oklahoma to New York uh, to, to study um, first college and then uh, medicine at New York University. And it was really at uh, Bellevue Hospital where I did my residency uh, at the height of the AIDS epidemic um, when we had so limited uh, treatments um, about, you know, for AIDS, very much like um, of what we're seeing with COVID that, that really was a, an aha moment for me personally and professionally and, and made it clear to me that I wanted to use my time, my talents, and my treasures to, to make a difference in the world, uh, to figure out why different um, uh, communities experience diseases differently, how to uh, uh, do my part to advance research so that we can be part of the research and part of the cures. And that whole decision set me on a 20 year uh, career path uh, that spanned uh, corporate, academic, nonprofit and government sectors. And here I am now at Pfizer uh, and really excited um, uh, to serve as a chief patient officer here. So I am Dr. Katana Lemier, and I am a native Tennessean. I am an associate professor in the College of Pharmacy at Xavier. 
for the last better than a decade, I have been teaching genomic medicine and my interest in that area and as a certified um, trained a trainer in pharmacogenomics, um, my journey has been very um, exciting for me to watch first the human genome be sequenced and then taking note as a postdoc um, doing prostate cancer research where um, at a translational level being able to see differences in how drug therapies, um, how patients of different ethnic origins, different different demographics responded differently. So in that, um, from that approach, it has led me to um, also being, and Dr. Dara and I met some time ago in her role on the All of Us Research Program, where I now serve on the advisory um, board for the Southern region of the All of Us Research Program. So, um, so my, um, my passion is to help to educate, inform, and advocate for people to have a better understanding of how the genes that they're in actually can impact their overall health and how to be proactive in better understanding and then um, and applying that information. I like the way you put that, the genes that they're in, right? Uh, especially, and I want to, I wanted, I do want to break into a, a bit of what you both are, are just bringing up. The first thing I will say, Dr. Lemier, is um, I, I didn't realize you were from Tennessee, so that's, that's, uh, where, where, in, where in the state are you from? I am. I hail from the metropolis of Columbia, Tennessee, the mule capital of the world. <laughs> okay. Okay. So we will get into you know. So we will talk about some regional um, things later on. I, I spent some time in Tennessee. I did. I did my graduate training at Vanderbilt, but I didn't have the opportunity to get over to Columbia one day once once this all lifts. But I do want to talk a little bit about um, you both brought up all of us, right? But before we get into that, just break it down for the audience you know, what's a clinical trial? What does it entail? And more specifically for people of color and especially for black people in America, what does all of us signify in the long term and then especially in this moment? Would you like me to start, Dr. You can, no, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to start. Um, so, so all of us is, is uh, work that we had done uh, can you, in the can past you start together. With explaining and, a, I'm sorry, Dr. Heron. Can you start with explaining what a clinical trial is? And then, and then work your way up to all of us? Yeah, so all of us is actually a clinical trial. Um, it is a, a, a way to get people involved in research. A clinical trial is a way to test new medications, new treatments. Uh, it's a way to, to help us better understand um, you know, the safety uh, and the uh, effectiveness of various different treatments. So it starts out in phase one, phase two, which are the earlier stages of the trials. And those are when you're really doing a limited number of people. And, and in this case, you should, so many trials start with animals first and then they start with humans. Um, but, but essentially, once you get to the point of, of, of testing medications and trials uh, in, in, in humans, you're basically trying to figure out if um, the drug that you've developed, one, is effective for the condition that you're trying to treat, and secondly, to make sure, and most importantly, that it's safe, uh, that it doesn't cause any negative impacts. Um, usually phase one and phase two trials are, are, are limited in, in, in size, but as you um, determine that something is effective and safe, then you expand to larger groups so that you can see what other potential impacts that maybe um, uh, you may have uh, adverse uh, reactions to a particular drug. So in a, in a nutshell, a, a clinical trial is, is a way to test a new drug or a new treatment to make sure that it's both safe and effective for the particular condition or treatment that you're trying to address. I don't know if Dr. Lumier wants to add to that. Um, no, I would just, the only thing I would add is just there are three distinct phases and most people hear uh, just clinical trial like it's an umbrella type of experience. There are three distinct phases and I think, and, and really one part of that is healthy people, which is what I think we're currently seeing in the meeting, in the media recruitment of healthy people to test new drugs that are considered for COVID. The next is a small cohort, as Dr. Dara has already stated, um, where we're just looking at to see if it's effective and for people who actually have the condition being screened for, and lastly, it's expanded. And they actually call it uh, part four when the drug is released to the general public, and even after some time, the FDA is still monitoring to determine the effectiveness and safety for the population at large. Thank you for breaking that down. And, and can you help the audience to connect the strings to, to all of us in this moment, um, and then beyond COVID, what is the significance of all of us? 
Yeah, so I'm happy to, to talk about the All of Us Research Program. It's a program that I was very passionate about in my prior job, um, uh, and it's really a program designed to increase diversity in clinical trials. Um, we know that African Americans in general are understandably concerned about uh, uh, participating in the research. I mean, we have, uh, unfortunately, historical transgressions that we all know about, whether it's, you know, the Havasupai tribe, whether it's, you know, Henrietta Lacks, whether it's the Tuskegee syphilis experience where, you know, African Americans and other um, uh, people from various different racial and ethnic backgrounds were not treated uh, appropriately um, and, and, and in research. And so what the All of Us Research Program uh, was attempting to do and is attempting to do is to make sure that um, all people um, have an opportunity to both participate in research, but more importantly, can participate in benefits from that research. Um, and the, um, the goal of the program was, was, it was actually put forth by President Obama in 2015 uh, at a State of the Union address, was to make sure that we have the right treatment for the right person at the right time. I think we all had a grandmother or someone who said, baby, I don't take that medicine anymore because it doesn't make me feel right. And you know, she was probably right because that medicine had probably never been tested uh, in people of color. So many of the drugs that many of us take every day uh, have never been tested in, in people of our lifestyle, our environment, our biology. And so what the All of Us Research Program was attempting to do was to recruit a million or more individuals um, of all races and all backgrounds um, so that we could look at the genetic makeup, look at the lifestyle, look at the environment and see how all of those things impact your ability to uh, metabolize or, or, or break down medicines or your ability to respond to treatments. And so it's a great program, it's still going. Um, it's um, at the time that I left in, in the end of January, over 250,000 people had signed up. And they did that because they trusted us with their information. We leveraged community organizations. We leveraged our relationships to really get out into the communities and educate them about the value proposition of participating in this research study. And it worked. Um, and, and now we have, well, well over, I'm sure they have probably close to 300,000 or more people who are in this study who will hopefully help us better understand disease disparities, why we are more impacted by various diseases, what is it about our genetic makeup uh, that really makes us more likely to respond to a particular medicine, and, and with hopes that at one point um, we'll be able to, to really even eliminate some, some of the disparities that we're seeing in our communities. And I would add that as a patient advocate on the, uh, and a scientist, my position, and it's been serving on the board, is also to ask the, the hard questions. So who's getting the data? Who's the gatekeeper of the data? How is the data, how are the data secured? Um, will there be equal access amongst all scientists and not just one demographic or majority institutions? Is it going to, is there equitable access uh, to the intellectual enterprise that will unfold from the gathering of all these data, given that all of us, one of the goals of all of us, as I understand, is to have better, at least 70% diversity in that pool of participants. That being said, is the distribution of funds to, to do the investigations and to better understand. So the collective intellectual enterprise, is it also inclusive? Yeah, yeah, and that was a big proponent of that that um, of that pro of the program was participants as partners, bringing in the advocacy groups, and making sure that um, there is a, a a real partnership with community organizations, um, both in the research and also in in the funding. So um, it's it's a great partnership. So let me let me pick up uh, some things that you all have just mentioned, and then in the last question, I want to make some some connections um, on, uh, for the audience. So you mentioned just now three very important words. You mentioned trust, you mentioned partnership, and you mentioned community, right? So I want to talk about why each of those components are significant for for understanding the the course of pandemics in general, and and not necessarily disease specific uh, outcomes uh, in, in terms of beyond COVID-19, but I, I do wanna, I do wanna center COVID-19. What, and what role does, uh, what role does clinical trials play in, in really grasping those three, those three uh, characteristics of trust, 
partnership and, and community. Um, the other thing I, I wanna talk about is, um, so Dr. Lemia, you mentioned earlier about, um, you, you used the phrase in those genes, right? Now we know that in terms of differences between people, race is not biological in, in the sense that race is a social construct, right? right? So can you, at the same time, to your, to both of your points, people of color in this nation historically have had uh, disparate and, and really inequitable, and I'm very considerate of using the terminology, inequitable um, differences in terms of health outcomes. And I say inequitable because as I've explained in, in previous um, series of this conversation, inequity refers to a difference that is avoidable, whereas disparity refers to a difference that is unavoidable. Right. So can you walk us through the um, really the the talk of race at the biological level when you're talking about genomics? And Dr. Uh, Heron, can you talk us through the, the three concepts of trust, partnership and community? Certainly. Thank you for the question. And really, I have to start by applauding the work of the National Minority Equality Forum for being at the forefront of helping um, as far as um, governmental dollars, that is research dollars, they track and monitor equitable um, dispensing and they ask the hard questions with, with it, are the dollars getting to the communities that really um, need those dollars? So I have to applaud them in the work that they're doing. But back to the um, question about um, equity. So African Americans, and I'll speak to the population because pharmacogenomics is population health. So we're speaking not to individuals, but we're speaking to populations. And one of the things that uh, we know that has been documented in the literature is that there is a difference in metabolizing, um, metabolism of certain drugs in certain populations of people. Um, as Dr. Dara mentioned earlier, grandmother doesn't take the medication. She, it makes her feel some kind of way. What, we, what science has shown us using the scientific method is that there are certain metabolic enzymes and not mutations, not disease causing, but uh, you just metabolize drugs differently. That being said, it is helpful when healthcare providers have that information so it can guide their decision making. And that's one of the promises of precision medicine back to when President Obama um, initially um, began to fund this, this whole enterprise. Um, well, one of the challenges that we have, one of the promises, I would say this with all of this program, is to provide this information to the participant and it's going to lend to better, to better informing science for generations to come. So um, one of the questions becomes, in my mind, when will they get those data and how will those data be used? In my mind, this is a perfect season for those participants to have that information to help guide decisions, for example, um, drugs that have been currently used in um, trials, or, um, um, hydroxychloroquine, for example, some other drugs that are currently being investigated. Those types of drugs, if I know a patient's genomic profile, I can predict if they're a good candidate. If I already know these patients have comorbidities, such as diabetes or hypertension, are they really good can candidates when 50% of this population are poor metabolizers? So those are the types of, uh, that's the type of information that all of us has the ability to give when it, um, as it begins to continually roll out its programming and provide the um, information back to those participants or partners in that program. So I hope I answered the question. That was a, that was a very sound, I, I think, I think um, what, you, what you really made plain is that it's not just that, it's not the, the color of one's skin that makes a difference in terms of the, the impact of, of the drug or the intervention. It has everything to do with like you mentioned, ex uh, pre-existing conditions, the extent to which not just individuals, but to your point, populations do carry um, a propensity toward chronic conditions that make changes on the cellular level, on the genetic level with respect to their metabolism. That is a very different ideation than Black people um, you know, uh, won't respond to this drug because of some other surface story. Exactly. that has no scientific base. Exactly, and I would just add one other thing that is very well documented um, between, there are studies that show Europeans 
Africans, African Americans, and Caucasians when measured for their expressions of certain if inflammatory mediators. They found that African Americans have the highest expression of all four cohorts. That disease such as diabetes and hypertension and even cancers, inflammation can, is consistently one of the underlying challenges there. And taken together, all of those things have to be considered when deciding on patient on drugs that a patient would receive or not receive. Thank you for that. Dr. Hahn, would you like to follow up? Yeah, so I, you know, I love your, your point, uh, a trust uh, partnership and community. So trust really is, is paramount, uh, particularly when we're thinking about um, clinical trials and research. Um, because, you know, if I don't trust um, someone um, has my best interest in heart, then it's not likely that I'm going to want to uh, participate in a clinical trial. And certainly with with COVID uh, disproportionately impacting minorities um, and minority populations in the United States, you know, we at Pfizer understand fully that uh, we must reach and, and, and make sure that everything we're doing um, is, is making an impact um, on the communities that are most uh, impacted by this condition. Um, and, and so for our COVID uh, clinical trials, we're, we're recruiting a patients in alignment with the early uh, data that's been produced by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention that tracks, um, you know, um, you know, who is being most impacted. And I think we know in, in most communities, uh, uh, individuals of color, for the reasons that Dr. Lemia mentioned and, and others, are, are being impacted at least twice if not more often, uh, two times, as, if not more often uh, than, um, than others. Um, so for our COVID uh, clinical trials, um, we are tracking uh, patient demographic data, uh, race, ethnicity uh, in real time, uh, and it's being monitored uh, throughout our recruitment because we wanna make sure that the individuals in our study match the individuals who are impacted. We don't want this study to be one where it only has European participants and we don't know how it impacts um, individuals of other races and ethnicities. Um, as your, to your point of partnership, this is a big undertaking, as everyone knows, to try to find um, the right vaccine um, for um, COVID-19. So we know we're not going to be able to do it alone. Uh, you may have heard about the partnership that we developed with a group in, in Europe to help um, us, uh, you know, manufacture a vaccine. Um, a partnership, not just, you know, of pharma companies, but we're going to require partnerships with community organizations um, so that we can um, make sure that the individuals who need to be part of our trials are part of it. Um, we're um, putting together and working and co-creating with those community organizations patient-focused materials that will educate our community. I don't know if you've seen, but there's been a lot in the news about there's a lot of miseducation in communities of color. There was something that just came out, you know, early in COVID that, you know, it wasn't impacting people of color. You might have heard Magic Johnson talk about that. Just yesterday, uh, Spike Lee was talking about how, you know, we need to make sure that our communities are aware uh, of various different um, myths that are out there and we can dispel them, but we also can provide the ed education that we all need to better understand uh, in this really, you know, um, unbelievably uh, surreal time. Um, we know that we have to conduct the studies in the locations that have the diverse communities. Uh, that's very important in, in retaining um, minority patients in this studies. And it's also important, um, I believe Dr. Lemier mentioned this, is to make sure that there's a diversity in the personnel conducting the studies. Um, so we're working on all of those things to try to make sure that those elements of, of trust, um, partnership and community are involved not only in this, um, uh, you know, uh, effort, but in all of the work that happens. Um, we really want to improve the clinical trial experience for everyone through uh, education, awareness, um, better access, uh, and, and, and we really want to make sure, again, and I, I say it and it's very important, if we are not part of the research, it's no guarantee that we're going to benefit from the cures. And so that's going to be very important. And, and you know, not even to mention, you know, 
the vaccine hesitancy that many people in our communities and other communities face right now, I would just hate that if we do ultimately end up, you know, whether Pfizer develops it or anyone develops it, a vaccine that is impactful for um, COVID-19 and the communities of color don't get the vaccine, then not only will we be more likely to die, you know, already, I mean, that's going to put us further behind the curve. So it's so important that we are really, really focusing on, you know, trust, partnership and community to get the right information out from the right messenger about why it's important uh, to participate in clinical trials, but also to get vaccines where appropriate uh, to, to help us um, get past this uh, epidemic or pandemic. Thank you both for those really very thorough answers. I want to bring the audience in um, a little bit at the, at, the, um, at the half hour mark, but can you just briefly tell us about who are the, the, um, the gatekeepers of clinical trials participation? Who brings, who brings people into the fold? Who are the, the, trusted, um, the, the trusted holders of the key to getting into trials? Well, just, I mean, just to, I mean, it, it, it's a broad answer. I mean, so, you know, various different hospitals and institutions around the world, you know, are doing research. And so they work with a, a variety of, of, of what is, is often called principal investigation, uh, investigators across various different sites. Um, as it relates to, to Pfizer, um, what we are doing, and in particular with the, the COVID-19 trial, is using the Johns Hopkins um, data around you know where um, the uh, pandemic has the most of people who have been impacted and we're identifying sites in those areas um, and, and investigators in those sites who have the experience and expertise to do the clinical trials but to your specific point on who the, who the gatekeeper is it's really anyone who is you know has a, a clinical trial that they're developing they partner uh, with a hospital or institution to 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 um, meet out those trials so it's a broad, anyone has a potential to be the gatekeeper. Agreed. I would, I would add to that, that um, institutions who are awarding or who are granting approval for clinical trials have institution review, review boards in your academic institutions and your big pharma, I understand, has a similar type of um, structure where they recruit not just scientists and uh, they also are looking for patients and lay people and engage the community. So it's, it's um, a holistic type of transparent um, governance, if you will, to monitor these trials. That is how they are built and that is how they're monitored. And then the FDA in this country, the FDA has to ultimately approve any trial that is going to be um, administered for whatever, if it's a new drug, a new device, a new procedure, whatever it is, the FDA is ultimately the one who grants approval for trials to go forward in this country. I appreciate you bringing in that, that aspect, both of you of uh, institutional partners at the, at the health systems level and then also at the federal agency level. You know, um, and, and, and um, I believe it was you, Dr. Heron, who mentioned earlier the, the uh, atrocious history of um, mistrust and, and abuse among certain communities, especially communities of color and marginalized and minoritized communities. And uh, it took it took a lot of that coming to the light of, of to the public's um, consciousness um, across the 20th century, such that we do finally have these institutional review boards, these IRBs, Dr. Lemier. Um, but it, it took it took some nasty things to happen for you know for agencies to say, okay, not only do we need to um, to make sure that people are protected. Um, during these these uh, generation of new new medicines and and interventions, but to your point uh, again, Dr. Lemier, that there that these uh, review boards um, institutionally and on on um, federal levels are representative of the patient populations that are um, that are really targeted in terms of, of interventions, um, for better or for worse. But but now I think we're certainly moving into a place of of responsibility and, um, and, and greater consciousness and intentionality around that. I want to uh, shoot a message or excuse me, shoot a question on over to the audience who can give us your feedback in terms of those people whom you trust. If, if, if say for instance, your, uh, your hospitalist, your primary care physician, your doctor found a clinical trial and recommended you to join, how likely 
would you would you want to participate? Um, so Keiko is going to put that um, that poll up, and and everyone, if you just give us your this is anonymous, of course, just give us your your gut feedback. If your doctor said, hey, we need you in this trial, this is the process. You know, how likely would you would you would you participate? And then also, if you wouldn't mind shooting um, a message in the either in the in the chat or in the Q&A, uh, just why you decided to answer it that way. OK, so um, if you can you talk to us about about what it takes to develop a vaccine and what we are seeing now with COVID, what we can expect um, in terms of vaccine development. I thought, I thought Dr. Herney, you were, you were getting into that a little bit with what Pfizer is doing. And Dr. Lemieux, yes, please, I thought, please also contribute where you feel fit. Certainly. Yeah, so, so thanks for the question. Um, you know, I, you know it, it, the, the purpose at, at Pfizer is to achieve uh, breakthroughs that, that change people's lives. And so, you know, I, I don't think there would be a more pressing time than ever uh, than where we are right now uh, in, the, in the time of COVID-19. And, and, and so that's why our group is, is you know, planning to, to leave really no stone unturned uh, and, and really are, are harnessing the, the depth and breadth of our resources to address this crisis. Because, you know, vaccines are really the, the best and perhaps the only long-term solution uh, to ending this pandemic. Um, at Pfizer, we have what we call a five-point plan for fighting COVID-19. Um, and, and, and we're really committed to, to bringing forth um, our deep heritage in vaccine development, um, the incredible reach and scale of our organization across many countries and, and the resources that we have financially to serve millions of people. And so we have a team of experts that's um, rapidly advancing multiple COVID-19 vaccine candidates into, cl uh, into clinical testing. Uh, with our research and development program, uh, and it's underway globally, as I mentioned before. And, and the program is unique. Um, there are four vaccine candidates that are being tested, uh, each representing a unique combination of what's called a messenger RNA format and target antigen. And you don't need to get into the details of that, but the, the real meat of this is that there are four different vaccine candidates being tested. So that means there's four chances to get it right, right? Um, and they chose the, the messenger RNA piece of it. And again, not getting too scientific, but just that's a, a, a good way um, because it, it, has, it can be manufactured quickly, it's cost effective, and it's very safe and flexible. Um, so this week, you may have heard that we announced the first participants have been, um, have received a dose of this vaccine in the United States in the phase, what we're calling phase one, two clinical trial. And just to give you an idea of, of what it generally takes, I mean, this is unprecedented. Uh, it's usually, this has happened in less than four months time frame, um, in, in which two companies, I mentioned the German company and our company have been able to move forward this. This would normally take a long much, much longer time. But uh, because of the brain power and the time that's uh, committed to this, it, in less than four months, um, there's a, a, a testing actually in human and, and, and in humans. Um, so that's the kind of thing that happens. Of course, we're not out of the woods yet. I mean, literally, that has to be tested over time uh, with the, the number of patients. And the first phase trial will have uh, about 360 participants. And once, again, safety and effectiveness is determined, then that will be scaled up to even larger um, groups. So that's a piece about um, the, the vaccines. Um, Pfizer is also looking at potential treatments because that's another approach. Um, you know, they're looking to, to you know, early stages, uh, but based on the results of some initial um, screening test, uh, there may be a lead molecule that, that could um, uh, inhibit one of the, the major, um, acti action, major um, areas of the virus. Um, and so that's really exciting. Um, and, and, you know, we're excited and hopeful um, that we'll either have a vaccine or a treatment, but we have to be clear that there's still a lot that none of us know about the source of the pandemic and the complexity of the virus. So, um, you know, we have to be clear that as one company, you know, we can't do it all. Again, that partnership work comes in, 
But I can assure you that um, Pfizer, we're pulling out all stops uh, to, to try to identify a vaccine and or treatments uh, to combat this pandemic. Um, and Thank I'm you. in agreement with Dr. Heron, what she said, uh, with respect to the, some of the drugs that, may, that were made mention of that are antiretrovirals, you're looking at um, drugs that are actually stopping the virus from being able to replicate. So that's the, the foundation of what is actually happening with some of the drugs that are currently being um, investigated. As far as a timeline, most biologics, most of your drugs from start to finish, um, take development from no less than 18 months to 24 months. That's typically what you see with a flu vaccine. That's the turnaround time for most of your uh, biologics. And that's assuming that everything goes right. They scale it right. There are no quality issues. Those types of things are, that, that timeline is pretty um, well established and was made mention of earlier. I would just, uh, um, and most people do respond. There is a um, a good history with, for the most part, with these um, biologics that are out there to include a number of um, anti-inflammatory drugs that have been taken off the market and are being considered for off-label use. Um, so when I look at those, the, the drugs that have entered into the pipeline for investigation or in some stage of clinical trial, Inflammatories. And so the, um, the biologics are addressing the disease, disease directly, whereas the anti-inflammatories are addressing underlying um, secondary, if you will, chronic um, effects associated with underlying disease. So it's almost like a one-two punch approach, if you will, to mitigate um, the, the um, tremendous impact that we've seen of COVID-19 in these vulnerable communities. Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm just going to repeat what you just said, what both of you just said, um, and I think it's important in, in terms of this next question that I have. So, Dr. Heron, you mentioned that um, that what's going on with with uh, with COVID, it's it's based on the on the RNA, on the mRNA, which is different than what we were just talking about um, earlier in terms of DNA, right? That's very different. Now, what you're talking about, Dr. Lemier, is that um, the and, and, and I say that, and I, the reason why I bring that up is to Dr. Lemieux's point, we don't, mRNA is unstable, correct? It if, is. Mm -hmm, it which is means it changes. It, it, well, it can't. So there are some things at the, at the bench that scientists can do to stabilize. They can take a, a single-stranded um, messenger RNA and make it be complementary DNA using um, polymerase chain reactions. So we've heard of this, this which is one of the two um, methods by which people are being screened for COVID-19. So that's one of the diagnostic tools that is being used. So the short answer is they are two different molecules. There's DNA, there's RNA, and there's protein. Those are the three components of what we call biologics, drugs that can be made of any one of those three components. And what I understand Dr. Heron mentioned, the drug that um, Pfizer is working with is working at the level of the RNA. So that is the specific area by which it is working. And so those are things that, that Um, how it's working. It's actually working to inhibit the virus from being able to replicate once it's in the host. That's a big thing. So you're, are you killing the virus? Not necessarily. What you are doing is preventing it from continuing to replicate itself and actually infecting other cells. So that is how you're controlling or mit mitigating the damage that the, the viral infection is doing to the host. Exactly. Boom, you, you broke it down perfectly. And I, I, I think that was made, made clear for everyone because it's, it's, to your point, it's not only important to, to understand on the biological cellular level, because you just took us back to classes that maybe many hadn't had for a while, um, to understand just how, just how that works, right? Um, and to your point, it's not just enough to stabilize the virus, you have to get at the underlying conditions that are so rife, especially within marginalized and minoritized communities, which is the complications associated with chronic conditions and the ways that that exacerbates the, how the virus lives in the body and, and, and really travels throughout and, and can determine one's, one's fatality or, and, and, you know, and so on and so forth. 
Um, let's take a look and see what people have said. Let's go back to the idea of, of, of trusting. Um, and most people are saying that they would be somewhat likely or, or very likely. So, so pretty much um, a, li a little over, well, almost 80% or so. Yeah, yeah, over 80% of people would, would say, oh no, hold on, hold on. It's a very good thing that no one is saying that they they wouldn't participate, but there's still some who are just not sure. Um, if you wouldn't mind just telling us um, in, in the chat box what would make you either not likely or unsure. Some people are saying, well, um, I would, uh, I answered the way I did because I needed, I need trusted, involved, informed community and faith leaders involved in the process. And I truly appreciate you both mentioning that on the IRB level, as well as on the um, on the on the industrial level, on the industry level, there's inclusion of those who are in the community to be a part of a major decision making. And others who have answered very likely or somewhat likely are saying, "I would be very likely to participate in the trial at the behest of my physician." So that that certainly um, implicates trust. Um, they have a vested relationship that's developed over time, where both the patient and the and the provider are um, are are standing as equals. So that matters. Appreciate you all answering that question. Um, I do want to pivot a little bit and pick up some of the um, some questions with respect to actually testing for COVID-19. So you were talking a little bit about um, Dr. Lemier about uh, antibodies and um, and and the virus. So can you tell us the mechanics of of, of the testing? Certainly. Sure. Primarily, there are three methods by which um, most people have seen in the media and in the public by which they can be screened for COVID-19. The first is the nasal pharyngeal swab, where you've seen people in drive through um, areas, big parking lots, and the healthcare provider comes out, inserts the long swab, and actually- Looks very comfortable. Sample, looks real comfortable. And they take a swab from there. That particular method is, um, is you, PCR is polymerase chain reaction is used looking for in, um, indicators or markers associated with the virus. So that is considered the most accurate method by which one could be tested. The second method to test or to screen is by the antibody test that um, the public has also heard about. We've also seen where certain people will go through in a space and get their finger pricked, where they're taking a sample of blood and doing what they're calling a seriology type of test, where they're screening against particular um, proteins associated with the COVID virus. And so patients are deemed to be either positive for the virus or negative. And that, that is with respect to proteins uh, or production of certain antibodies that the patient would have with respect to being exposed to uh, the coronavirus. So that's um, test number two. The third test that, it, that you're li less likely to see, but it has been in the media as well, is called the antigen test. The antigen test looks more like a pregnancy test with a WIC by which there is a line to indicate positive or negative for um, presence of um, coronavirus um, protein products. And so that test has not been well received because there's a, there are concerns with levels of accuracy associated with that particular test. But the primary two are going to be with respect to one, the swab, and it looks at the PCR, the genetic material associated with the virus, or two, the antibody test, where the patient has actually raised antibodies against the COVID, uh, coronavirus and begun to express those and they're, and they're easily detected. So in terms of, uh, and I want you to jump in here too, Dr. Heron, in terms of presentation of symptoms, what would determine, what, what presentation would determine which of the three tests, whether it be the swab, the antibody test, or the antigen test that someone potentially with, with coronavirus would take? Well, one thing that he's given me, and Dr. Heron, I don't know if you wanted to jump in here first. No, you go ahead. Okay. Um, one of the things that has been a concern, I think, to the general public is that some of these, uh, they're talking about home testing. Mm -hmm. home testing has been primarily, from what I've seen, the antigen test. That one has, 
there's there have been concerns expressed about the reliability of that particular test so personally that would not be a test that i would go for if i were concerned about being exposed to the virus if i were exposed to the virus the um either the swab the nasopharyngeal swab would be the test that i would go for which is considered to be the most accurate of the tests that are provided or and that one is typically to folks who are not necessarily symptomatic but who believe they may have been around someone that they could possibly be a carrier to a vulnerable um person in their in their orcoise that is that um, they're caring for an elderly, elderly parent or someone who may be chronically ill um, the antibody test is a more rapid return on those data and we're seeing more of the healthcare providers who are frontline providers that are being screened using the antibody test it's a quick turnaround 10 to 15 minutes i know readily if this patient has raised antibodies against that particular um against the coronavirus so those are the the three approaches or the things to think about. Yeah, and I, I would just add that you've probably heard in the media, there's a lot of discussion about tests, but the antibody tests are generally not used to determine whether or not you have active infection. You know, antibody, the um, antibody tests are, can also be used to determine whether or not you you have been exposed to the virus. But I think in your, your real question was about symptoms, I think, and, and what we're seeing now with, with COVID is that you could present with a number of different symptoms. I think what we originally started out with was, you know, cough, you know, maybe shortness of breath. And then we talked about, you know, maybe um, a, a decreased uh, ability to, uh, to smell. And now we're seeing that people are presenting with all sorts of things, even in some communities of color, you know, clotting uh, difficulties. Uh, we're seeing um, end organ damage. Uh, we're seeing, and what I mean end organ damage, damage to kidneys, damage to, to the brain, and, and, and we know about the damage to the lungs. So um, the general presentation, you know, is, you know, shortness of breath um, and, you know, uh, you know, maybe sometimes a, a issue with smell and, and a cough. But what we're seeing with COVID is, is, is you know, we're learning more and more every day. And, and so anyone can present with any number of symptoms and still, you know, um, have the virus. So it's very important to, to just be aware of that because, you know, there have been many people who haven't had a cough uh, or, or haven't had any shortness of breath and, and they still were diagnosed with the virus. And, and I think what you're both getting at in terms of, of the, not just the in, instability of, of the virus um, in, in terms of its changing, changeling nature, but that kind of thing puts people on edge, you know, it's, it's, it's okay, it's, oh, well, first, if you had a dry cough and you had a fever, then you need to potentially go and go for a nasal swab or, or, you know, now it's to your point, if you're presenting with diarrhea, you know, and, and people were saying, well, it's not in the GI tract, so you don't have to worry about it being, you know, something that you would consume. But now there's, there's to your point, talk about, um, especially in children, it's presenting itself in a very different and disturbing way. You know, so all of this, um, one of you mentioned the prevalence of misinformation. Um, in addition to misinformation, there's just a lot of information and, and people don't always uh, know who to trust or who to go to to ask good questions about the virus and, and to bring it back to clinical trials, don't always know how to, how to um, trust, you know, or who, who, who to trust for that. So I do want to ask another poll um, question to the audience, um, you know, which organizations, and, and, and please select one, um, which organizations in our society have the greatest responsibility about um, educating people on clinical trials? And it's okay to be unsure, but also please give give these um, these answers a or excuse me yes these answers a uh, true consideration. I'll give you a couple more seconds. And if I could, just, is it okay if I just make up a, a point? Please. I want to make yeah. So I just like to say that um, you know certainly. I think we all just have to be honest with ourselves and, and say that there's probably more we don't know about COVID than, than what we do know. And so I use, you know, trusted uh, resources like, you know, the CDC, um, you know, the National Institutes of Health. I mean, I, I really try to rely on those sources, but I think, you know, back to your point of trust, you know, there's also honesty. And I think we have to just be honest and, and say that there's a lot more 
that we don't know than what we do know. And so that's why I hate to just hang my hat on any one thing and say, you know, if you have these three symptoms, then you might have it. I think we need to just keep paying attention to what's happening in the world, um, talk to the doctors and the community and the nurses and the leaders that we respect and trust, make sure we have the most accurate information and don't act on what we see uh, on a meme uh, in the internet or, or, or so, you know, just, I've seen so many things out there that, that are just not right. Uh, and it's not just memes on the internet. I mean, some of our, our leaders, you know, might not be giving us the right information. So I, I just think it's so important for communities of color in particular to make sure that we are leveraging, you know, the people that we trust and the organizations we trust to give us the best information for our health. Oh. I would like to add, I would agree with that, but also informing people where they can be advocates for themselves and, and giving them good information so they can ask the right questions and also accountability, holding people accountable. If in fact, and we mentioned earlier, these institutional review boards are comprised not just of scientists and clinicians, but also of lay people. If you're not on one, reach out to your local universities, reach out to, if you have, if you're in areas where there is big pharma, reach out, send those folks emails and let them know you have a vested interest and you want to be a part of the conversation volunteer to sit on the boards volunteer to be a voice because if we're we we must we can't assume that that we can't put all of the responsibility on other people. We to ourselves our, ourselves have a responsibility for our own self care, our own self awareness, and also being selective about the information that we glean and we actually use to um, inform ourselves on decisions to um, best advocate for ourselves or our loved ones. So there is a responsibility that extends beyond the that is oneself and that is being doing your due diligence and taking responsibility, being present, staying woke, complete your census, vote, all of those things matter to provide us with the best holistic care. Because when we look at the, um, the, the trials, and that's one aspect of it. When we speak to social, social determinants of health, that is a holistic approach to one's wellness. And we cannot do one without the other. And so we must empower ourselves by being present and holding first ourselves accountable and then others. You know, I, I wanna to touch on the, um the point that you just made about personal responsibility, individual responsibility, and frankly, there's a tension in our nation between personal responsibility and social determinants of health. They're, they're, I, I don't believe that they're mutually exclusive, but you know, they, they, it's almost like the chicken and the egg. Where does, where does individual responsibility start and where, does, uh, where do socially determinant factors pick up, right? Um, and to your point, yes, we have an extreme responsibility as people living in this world to educate ourselves and, and to really impact whatever our world consists of. So, so what I want the audience to do at this moment, and then we'll, we'll go back, we'll go back eventually to the polar results. I want you to drop uh, just very quick lists about where you go to for information, not necessarily for information in the now, but what books do you, have you read? that might inform your orientation around science, around history, around socially determinant factors, around medicine, around public health, um, and, and what kinds of resources are you looking for? Um, what, what additional questions do you have? I can share with you, I'm a medical sociologist by training and, 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 and a policy expert on a number of books that have just completely changed my life and I make it a point to read them on a, on a yearly basis, Medical Apartheid by Harriet Washington. Um, I've read the um, several times the the uh, so because we're talking clinical trials you have to read the um, you have to read um, the the book one on Henry, Henrietta Lacks by um, Rebecca Skloot. Um I would also suggest reading anything anything that W. E. B. Du Bois has written because he was probably the, he was the first in our nation to talk about social determinants of health before we ever had a terminology for it. Um, I would also encourage you to read about um, policies and politics with respect to um, 
to health in, 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 our, in our nation. And when I say health policies, I don't mean explicitly within the healthcare context. I'm, I am talking about policies that bear on people's um, abilities to make healthy choices, to actually have healthy choices to make. Um, so definitely brush up on your history. In terms of, um, in, in terms of, of the scientists who we're talking precision medicine, I encourage you to read anything by um, Dorothy Roberts or Alondra Nelson or Ruha Benjamin, all three of whom talk about uh, politics of the body, uh, science of, of the body, and, um, and really bolster yourselves in a way beyond your industry. Um, because to the point of our panelists, if we are unable as individuals to really thread the needle between the, you know, the intersections of science and history and public health, then we will always get caught up in, in the individual responsibility tenor to the detriment of understanding the roles that institutions play uh, in helping us to be well. So you don't drop individual responsibility, but really understand that um, togetherness is strength and accountability of our institutions is what makes the major difference in our individual ability to make um, healthy decisions. We have, um, let me see, so, so we have some people who are mentioning, yes, so Medical Apartheid by uh, Harriet Washington, and, and, and not just Medical Apartheid, all three of her books, she's got another book called um, Monopoly something or other, I can't, Monopoly of Medicine or something like that, and the third one just recently came out, uh, Environmental Racism, um, that came out last year. So definitely pick those, those books up. I, we are running into the four minute mark. Unequal treatment, yes, and unequal treatment is another one. Um, unequal treatment, in terms of the report, unequal treatment, if you haven't read the report that, um, that was led by a number of people, including Dr. Brian Smedley. Um, so after, after, the, after the implementation, the enactment of the, the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act, what we call the ACA, um, there was a commission by Congress to, um, to produce a report, an updated report from, um, from, from, well, let me back up. There was an initial report in the 1980s by HHS, then HHS Secretary Margaret Heckler, who, who, was, a, who was a Republican. And under her administration at HHS, there was a report on, on essentially the disparities that, that exist, and it was the terminology at that time, disparities, that exist between white Americans and people of color. There was an updated report, unequal treatment, um, after the, the ACA, and I would argue that we need, we need something uh, in the wake of COVID to really talk to uh, what's going on now. I can wax poetic about what to read for days and days. Um, our, our, um, our panelists have given us some serious fodder um, what are you all reading, the two of you? What, what do you suggest that people pick up, even if they don't understand a damn thing that's in the book? What do they do to pick up? There are two that are the top of my mind. One is The Covenant by Tavis Smiley that actually gives lay people real practical approaches to how to take ownership of your own health, your own information, your own self. The other is um, The Souls of Black Folk by Douglas yes. Voice yep. um, that you mentioned earlier. Um, as a Fiskite, and I, I read it as a freshman at Fisk, and I've read it maybe three times since, I'm reminded not just of the the social determinants of health and the whole the, Amer the, the realization of the American dream, but the role that we all play in realizing and the responsibility that the talented 10th mm -hmm. have to help make, to be the voice of those who have no voice. Mm -hmm. So the two boy books that are top of mind for me. Thank you for that. Yeah, and I believe you covered most of the ones that I would have mentioned. Um, okay. We have a, a robust list. Good, good. Let's see, I think, let's see. Um, I thought someone else was going to put something else in the comments. We are running into the two minute mark. I wish we could keep this going. Um, to our audience, if you have additional questions, please send them to Keiko Purnell um, over at NMQS so that she can get them to our panelists who could potentially follow up. Um, and then otherwise just hold them in the, in the, in the, uh, in the knowledge vault at NMQF. Um, for additional information again on, on all of us, please visit the NIH website. Um, I, I hope that you all can give virtual applause to our fantastic panelists today, Dr. Dara Richardson-Heron, Dr. Katan, Katana Lemier, whose name I'm really having fun saying in my head, so um, I, might, I might be uh, 
if we run into each other in person, you know, don't be too surprised if I say your name more than once. Um, ladies, thank you so very much for your time. I'll hand it over to, uh, to Brandon. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you all for giving us all of that information as well. I mean, we went from a breakdown in the basics of, you know, clinical trials and then got a little more detailed and but we, we learned along the way and we learned that it's, you know, everybody's responsibility. And then I also got a reading list uh, from Mia Keys that she's getting her PhD in. Right. So, <laughs> so um, I, I've probably only read three of those books that she mentioned, but now I have a, a few more to read. Um, but with that, I'd just like to finally just say thanks again and thanks for being um, sort of taking everything seriously with COVID and making sure that um, not like the panelists, thanks for educating all educating, excuse me, educating everyone on the call and so that they too can educate others that aren't as familiar. So each one teach one um, and everyone have a good uh, Friday afternoon. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Have a good one. Stay safe. Yeah.